How could you let her touch you in a place you didn't want it touched? How could you let her get so close to you that she could kiss your neck and kiss it gently and kiss it gently and kiss it gently? How could you take her number from her when you met her in that bar? How could you offer her a drink and then the front seat of your car and kiss her gently and kiss her gently and kiss her hard? How could you lie to me right to my face? How could your best friends, ex-girlfriends, younger sisters mate? No, before I did, before I did, before I did. Hey everybody, my name is Ian Garcia. This is Devotional Criticism, and this is this week's second episode of the New Movie Diary, a cinema criticism series in which I review recent, new, and up-and-coming film releases and attempt to give you the straight facts about them in my humble opinion. I hope you guys appreciated my terrible rendition of that Kate Nash classic, but I certainly got an early Christmas present last week because of the three movies I saw, all of them were at least pretty good, and two of them I'm confident saying were downright masterpieces. As far as the first of those masterpieces, Godzilla Minus One, I devoted an entire episode to that. If you haven't seen it, check it out. I think if you're one of the many people who's not even aware that there's a new Japanese Godzilla movie in theaters right now, you owe it to yourself to see one of the best Godzilla movies ever made. Like, seriously. But yeah, check out that video for that review. This episode is going to be concentrated on the two other movies, a very fun double feature I had last Thursday, and as far as which of these other two, which one of them was the second downright masterpiece, well, stick around and see if you can guess which one. First up is The Shift, and I know what you're thinking. Jesus Christ, Ian, how many Christian movies are you going to see this year? We get it. We get it. You really like Jesus Revolution. Guess what? Nobody cares. Nobody gives a shit. Enough with the Christian movies. No more Bible musicals. No more stealth conversion propaganda. Enough with the Christian movies. I can't do it, church. I can't resist. I'm the only secular critic who cares, and I keep trying to tell people there is an ascendant reactionary cultural movement going on right now. There is a lot more money going into faith-based media now, and if you're not paying attention, if you're not keeping tabs on the way they're moving in to eat up the low- and mid-budget film market the majors have left behind, if you're not paying attention to how their financing is getting more robust and that their filmmaking is getting more sophisticated formally and narratively, you're going to be caught off guard when you wake up one morning and fully half of the movies at your multiplex are Christian movies. This is culture and ethnography for me. I'm on a mission to explore, to ride this wave of faith-based media renaissance, and right now that wave is taking me in one of my favorite directions, which is not just the Christian movie, but the Christian science fiction movie. Yes! In this case, The Shift is the latest release from Angel Studios, the same distributor behind the highly successful television series The Chosen. This is just the third of Angel Studios' limited theatrical releases from this year, which also includes the controversial right-wing propaganda movie Sound of Freedom and the faith-based documentary After Death. The Shift is written and directed by one Brock Heasley. This is Heasley's feature film debut, and in fact, it appears that The Shift is expanded from a concept that Heasley originally applied to a short film he completed all the way back in 2017. And basically what the concept boils down to is, again, consistent with my morbid fascination with faith-based media, I think by both faith-based and secular standards a fairly novel and interesting idea, which is a science fiction story involving dimensional travel inspired by the Book of Job. Oh, come on, you all know the Book of Job, major poetic work of the Hebrew and Christian Bible. Job's a happy, righteous guy with wealth and a nice family. Satan challenges God that Job wouldn't be so pious before God if his blessings were taken away, and God allows Satan to test Job. In this case, our Job is Kevin, played by Christopher Polaha. When we're introduced to him, he's a stock trader who loses his job during the 2008 financial collapse, so there's the loss of his wealth, but while while he's drinking at the bar, he has a chance encounter with a beautiful Christian woman named Molly, played by Elizabeth Tabish. They fall in love, they get married, flash forward several years, and Kevin and Molly are still married, but they're very emotionally estranged from one another. Molly appears to have taken up drinking. There's a photograph of their son shown early on, but we never see him in 
toning something bad. And Kevin himself is basically on the verge of getting fired from his much lower paying job when he gets into a really nasty auto collision and wakes up to find himself in what appears to be the same place as his accident, now strangely depopulated of everyone except for a mysterious, very devilish looking and acting person who identifies himself only as the benefactor. It's obviously Satan. And obviously Satan is played by character actor great Neil McDonough, so if nothing else, you get some really consummate scene chewing out of it all. But where the story starts going, and I think I can see the skeleton of Heasley's earlier short film, where it goes is all very Twilight Zone. The benefactor invites Kevin into a diner where all the people there seem to be there against their will. Kevin seems to figure out rather quickly that he's Satan, and basically what the benefactor reveals is basically, we've got a multiverse situation. For every decision you make, there's an infinite number of parallel realities, and apparently what the benefactor has been doing is traveling in between these realities and recruiting really bad dudes there to be his minions. And it turns out that in pretty much every other universe except this one, Kevin is kind of a bag, but he pulls a Neo and manages to defy the devil and literally getting him to disappear by simply praying to God for help. But now it turns out that though the devil is apparently gone, Kevin has been left stranded in this dimension that the devil took him to, and this is where shit gets really wild because basically in the universe that the devil brought Kevin to, the world was torn apart by war to such an extreme that some new government developed technology that allowed people to travel between and more importantly to condemn problematic people to being basically exiled to other universes. And so what happens is that the devil comes in, takes advantage of the faithlessness of this universe, uses the technology to take it over, and is almost like using this apocalyptic world as a base of operations for a larger project of infecting all the other universes or something. I'm not quite solid on what the point was supposed to be. But basically, Kevin is stranded there. He's trying to find his way back home, but in order to do that, he would need to get his hands on one of those devices that allows you to shift between universes, and that's easier said than done. He also has to be in hiding because he's known the world over as the guy who defied the benefactor, and so he's also writing down half-remembered bits of scripture and basically proselytizing in secret on behalf of Jesus. It's wild. Also, this is total aside. It isn't relevant to anything I I was just talking about, but this is a message to the distributors. You probably don't want to release this as the shift in Ireland because it will make it sound like something that you don't want your Christian movie to sound like it's about. All right, back on point. I know a lot of you are probably thinking that this is basically the evangelical answer to everything, everywhere, all at once, right? And I certainly had that impression going in, and it probably wasn't an incidental factor in terms of this film getting financed at all. But I will say that in terms of tone and style, it's really a lot more like the sorts of darker Spielberg sci-fi movies. I feel like Heasley is especially taking inspiration from Minority Report, although there's also a small touch of Terry gilliam -esque sardonic humor and quirkiness, a little bit of 12 monkeys. Of course, overall, this is a very squeaky clean, family-appropriate Christian movie, but quite honestly, I do think it has a nice sense of edginess. Structurally, I don't think that the narrative is very neat when you finally reach the climax, despite the fact that you can kind of remember that this was what the film was supposed to be leading up to. Honestly, I think Heasley's screenplay is a little too distracted at times by these various themes he wants to pursue. And so when the climax does come, there is an extent to which it feels like it kind of comes out of nowhere. You can think back and see schematically how it's supposed to work towards that. But it feels honestly like the shift is almost mostly a series of overlapping tangents or concentric themes masquerading as a plot that don't really come together fully. Part of the problem is merely cultural translation. You're supposed to be watching this movie with the understanding that Kevin doesn't really have an active goal when we first meet him. Despite the plot synopsis I gave, it wasn't totally accurate in the sense that 
when we meet him in this universe at the point he is in the story after meeting the devil, it's been like five years that he's stuck there. So at the point we meet him, he's not actively trying to get back to his wife, and he's not trying to be a prophet of this universe either, which is currently in the midst of the reign of the Antichrist. That just sort of happens because he's a truly faithful and devout Christian who has accepted what has happened to him and trusts that God will redeem him from his suffering. Which is, of course, generally faithful to the book of Job, but like most present-day Christian films that attempt to interpret the books of the Older Testament, that still ends up being dramatized in a rather textualist way, because in the book of Job, Job gets to talk back to God. He gets to rile God up, and there's a small moment when Kevin has that kind of exacerbated yell at the sky, what do you want for me, like, freak-out moment. But it just doesn't really resonate as a significant part of the character or the story because, quite frankly, Polaha doesn't portray a character who, leading up to that point, seems to have any credible even suggestions of doubts or internal conflict. I think he and Heasley kind of lose sight of the fact that Polaha is not supposed to be portraying someone who is just another Christian movie mascot for faith. He's supposed to be portraying a Job character where, at the very least, you need some kind of subtle suggestion that whatever they say on the outside, there are still these deep, abysmal doubts and internal suffering underneath all the proselytism that is supposed to come through, that that's supposed to be what this is all about, which is reconciling doubt in the face of our absence of divine wisdom, and especially how God can allow for suffering and evil in the world. Basically, what I mean is that you need to go into this movie taking for granted that it's operating on the assumption that you know that what Kevin is doing from the beginning is just spreading the word of God in secret and waiting for God to rescue him like a good Christian is supposed to. Anything else, whether it's getting a hold of a shifter or getting back to his wife, or even attempting to assassinate the benefactor at one point, all of that is impulsive and even strangely kind of secondary. And it is a flaw of the movie. It is treated as too spontaneous and secondary by these filmmakers who are still kind of confusing their desire to make a spiritually inspiring film with a story that adequately conveys a human emotional journey that someone can relate to at a more general personal level. But even still, at a technical level, this is another in the spate of recent Christian movies I've seen that has had a really big step up in cinematography, and especially some of the original scoring and music in this film is really quite nice. I also love the limited usage of production design and costuming to create this post-apocalyptic world, and the acting in general, even accepting the kind of confusion of Polaha's protagonist. The acting is quite decent. I think supporting players Sean Astin, and that, yes, that is the same Sean Astin from the Lord of the Rings films. He's a major supporting actor in Christian cinema. He obviously has a very diverse career, but it's really weird because you know that you watch too many Christian films when you start to recognize actors from being in Christian movies, even if you've literally seen them a million times before in secular movies. Anyway, Sean Astin is good, as is John Billingsley. They come off especially well. But then again, if you're going to be in a Christian movie, you tend to want to get those more minor character parts. Talk about the Book of Job. Polaha is being tested in secret by having to play the least interesting character in the whole movie. Overall, I think this has just the right comment combination of generally guileless sense of spiritual wholesomeness, although that setup to the post-apocalyptic world is still really weird because it's almost like Heasley is doing this cryptic both sides thing where at first he portrays the world as being torn apart by conventional nation states and their militaries, but then when the technology to shift people comes into play, it's basically implied that at some point, like, woke secularists took over and got rid of all of the problematic people, which especially includes people in the military and people in finance. Also connecting to Kevin, he's a former finance guy who is experiencing the apparent societal systemic prejudice against finance guys, you know, cry me a f***ing river. But 
that's the thing is that like there it's not really subtle that use of problematic is literally what Polaha says in the narration that's the word he uses for it and that's what invites the antichrist in to take over there's obviously a weird element there of maybe portraying the rapture in a more interpretive way but overall despite the obvious crypto conservative chicanery that you're gonna get in any Christian movie it's generally harmless in terms of the story of hope and faith it's trying to tell but like all Christian sci-fi movies it greatly benefits from the sci-fi element because much like Assassin 33 AD because the sci-fi part is modifying the Christian part you end up having all these really messed up speculative questions plastered over a genre of film that is made for like the exact opposite of speculative and questioning things like even the divine state of the universe. Listen, I'm coming at this from the perspective of someone who received a Catholic education for 12 years, was fairly devout when he was at least really young, so I approach these things through the glee of being basically not just a person watching a movie, but a person watching a movie from behind this film of doubt, this film of speculation and analysis of all of these contradictions that the intended all audience is not necessarily going to notice. Because that's the thing, my general interpretation of the film is basically that in this world that Kevin has been condemned to, Armageddon, the Book of Revelations, it's already happening, and it's happened precisely because man-made technology has opened up this perilous void between worlds that now the devil can not only move through, but exploit to infect the other universes around it. So from an eschatological perspective, that makes sense, because how, as a Christian, do you interpret the theory of multiple universes when your religion teaches you effectively that there is only one inerrant God who is the prime mover of the one universe where each individual soul is his unique creation. Well, in the case of the shift, there seems to be this very interesting interpretation of the book of Revelation where Heasley is suggesting that even if there are infinite versions of you, all of whom could be morally divergent from one another, even if there are these infinite permutations of the world as we know it, the prime Prophecy of Christ is always a factor, and whatever happens in one of those universes in terms of the incitement of Armageddon, that threatens to infect everything else because Satan cannot prevail in one universe and the rest of the multiverse will remain with God. God has to have all of it or none of it. Either it's all fallen or it's all saved. But that still leaves this big gaping question of like, okay, so there's only one God and one devil, but there's still infinite permutations of the world as we know it with infinite permutations of Kevin. We know Kevin is going to go to heaven because he's such a good dude, but a lot of the parallel versions of him who have been recruited by the devil, who have sold their souls to him, they're definitely going to the pit of worms after the day of judgment. So even if there's only one God and one devil, but multiple versions of the same person, does that mean that there's more than one heaven and more than one hell, one for each universe? Also, like, if there are all these infinite universes and Christianity is constant throughout them, does that mean that, like, there are multiple incarnations of Christ? Are there, like, multiple assemblies of the apostles? Are there places where there's only, like, 10 apostles? If these universes are based on the chaos of human choice, does that mean there's a universe where Judas doesn't portray Jesus? Or that there's a universe where the apostle Thomas's parents didn't get married, so instead of the doubting Thomas story, there's a version of the Gospel of John where it's like, doubting Gavin or something? Are there like different versions of the Gospels that are affected by minor changes in minor choices by people who aren't divine actors? But if there are those minor changes in those minor books by people who aren't divine actors, doesn't that hurt the evangelical integrity of the Bible being the inerrant word of God? Because if if the whole thing is the danger that Satan is going to use the base of Armageddon in one place to infect the divine nature of the rest of the places, then yeah, God can only have the one place. There can only be the one book, so how can there still be these multiverse choices. Look, I know I'm doing a very poor job of recommending this movie as, like, just a movie, so let me reiterate, 
I do think that warts and all, this is a very fun and engaging, technically well put together, decently written and acted low budget sci-fi movie. And it's especially good in light of most Christian films, but if you're really going to get as much out of it as I did, you're going to have to learn to enjoy mucking around in the psychic playground that is modern Christianity, where the more of these films you see, and especially the more Christian sci-fi films you see, you start to realize that in spite of the broad American cultural conservative consensus that the supposed adherence is to strict constructionist interpretations of scripture, all you need to do is watch a movie like The Shift, which is a significant production by a major studio in the faith-based industry, and realize just how utterly insane and self-contradictory and discontented even most Christians are from the concept of, like, even a basic adherence to the idea that, oh, wait, maybe we shouldn't be making a movie in which we do blasphemy and suggest that God's word is relative. It's a tough conceptual road to hoe because obviously it's impossible to be any kind of real fundamentalist Christian in a society where you've spent your entire life being bombarded with modernity. So a movie like The Shift ends up doing everything it can in this broadly trending effort by ascendant Christian conservatives to sublimate their actual politics into what they think will just look like more anodyne moral parables but where they literally can't help themselves from basically conceiving a completely new religious worldview that has basically no connection to the very scriptures that they're deriving their faith from. I obviously get way more out of even the average Christian film than most of you out there, and probably even most Christians do, but I can't help but for its own self-contained quality and its elements of morbid interest, I can't help but recommend The Shift as a new classic of its genre, so I'm giving it a three and a half out of five. I really had a lot of fun with this one. Meanwhile, on the complete opposite side of the cinematic terrain from the squeaky clean faith-based entertainment, we've got Silent Night, a new ultra-violent vigilante action thriller written by Robert Archer Lynn and directed by none other than action auteur extraordinaire John Woo. This stars Joel Kinnaman as an electrician living in East L.A. with his wife, played by Catalina Sandino Moreno, and their son Taylor. Taylor is killed by a stray bullet in a drive-by shooting incident, and in his own enraged attempts to apprehend the men responsible, Kinnaman is shot in the throat by a gangster warlord known only as Playa, played by Harold Torres. Recovering from his injuries, Kinnaman's character loses the ability to speak and, consumed by depression and rage over the loss of his son, begins a years-long preparation to take his revenge on the people responsible for his son's death, marking the spot on the anniversary of his son's death, Christmas Eve. The gimmick here is that Silent Night is dramatized with effectively no continuous dialogue. There are moments of background chatter and single, often broken attempts at speaking here and there, but for the most part, the story is told entirely through visuals and music, with Wu gracing us with new innovations of his now well-known grand operatic style of action that actually sees him oftentimes telling his story with longer takes and more drawn out of a pace than we're used to from him. And at its height, it creates this really strange collision between the elegiac and the totally morbid. This is getting really polarized responses from people, so I guess I might as well just say straight out of the gate that I absolutely loved this movie. It's certainly not necessarily the most original of films in the world, either in terms of action films in general or vigilante stories in particular, but I do have to say that I think this production's willingness to take the risk of really sticking to its gimmick is rewarded immensely in terms of Wu's ability to overcome those very cliches by giving us something that feels, even for how formalistic it is, so much less superficial and so much more attentive to the performers at the center of this highly choreographed drama. Joel Kinnaman in particular gives easily one of the best performances of his career here, and part of what works so much about it is that this is one of the few vigilante movies I've seen since the original Death Wish that really attempts to balance the more visceral, violent power fantasies of revenge 
with a more subversive psychological view of the character. So much of this film is devoted to what would more typically be treated as merely a montage, if that, in other action movies. Which is to say that so much of the first half of the film is simply a portrayal of Kinnaman preparing himself, of transforming himself from this mild-mannered, unremarkable dude into a cold-blooded tactical killing machine. And without the benefit of dialogue, you're really left with a strange, exciting feeling of the sheer awkwardness of Kinnaman's plan, of really getting to watch this guy go from someone who is completely out of shape and incompetent and completely out of his depth too, to a guy who now is a tactical killing machine, but where there's actually still this lingering doubt and tension as to whether or not this is going to pay off in the bloody ritualistic ballet of death that we're waiting for, or maybe it's all just going on in his head, if this is all just a power fan. And when it comes to that second half of the movie, when Kinnaman's plan goes into effect, Wu really gets the most out of Lin's screenplay and emphasizing how once push comes to shove, it actually doesn't matter that Kinnaman is now a tactical killing machine, because now he's not just fighting a mannequin or whatever. Now he's really getting into brawls and shootouts with real gangsters and real bad guys, and you actually see a very credible sense of not just the physical, but also the psychological toll that it takes on him as well as the consequences bred by his escalation of the violence. There's this great part in the movie where Kinnaman kills two of Playa's men, and immediately after, he just opens his door and throws up. And so even at this late point for the character, we see Kinnaman really get to portray somebody who isn't a cool dude, but someone who is still this shaken, even kind of weak person who is basically undergoing a long psychotic break. He's doing these things even though it's not a reward to him. He's not getting out of it what he thought he would. What it amounts to is not so much a deconstruction of the vigilante film as it is this really refined example example of the genre where Lin's screenplay kind of boils it all down to its essential elements, doesn't bother wasting the reader's time with one-liners or the kind of dialogue that is only going to re-emphasize how formulaic it all is, but once that boilerplate skeleton structure is found, what is built on top of it is this surprisingly careful and studied exploration of not just aestheticized violence, but of all of those details that might otherwise be one-off notes that are marginal to the purpose of the average action film, but with Wu at the helm, expands to become so much more of the sweeping emotional tide of the film that vacillates so much between smoothly executed dynamic action and just brutal, awkward sabotaging of the entire facade of the action fantasy with tons of little touches that keep drawing you into the world that Wu has created rather than holding you at a distance with its formalism and its gimmick. There's even an extent to which Wu's more operatic approach to direction, where he's really not at all concerned with whether you think his movie is silly or over-serious, that for as kind of definitionally reactionary and cliche as Silent Night is, it almost doubles back and becomes one of the most humanizing action or crime movies you're likely to see this year. Moreno certainly gives her own excellent silent performance. You can really see the subtle conflict behind her eyes where at once she's being spiritually destroyed by the mental decline of her husband, but you can still see the glimmer of sympathy with him and the support in his desire for revenge and what he's doing. Doing. And on the other hand, without dialogue, Wu doesn't just present us with an ogre-like villain when casting Harold Torres as Playa. There are parts of this movie, especially at the climax, where we really get to see Playa in his world and in his element where you start to understand that while Wu understands that this is a bad person, like many bad guys and gangsters in his films, he's also inflecting his depiction of Playa with a kind of romantic sympathy and an understanding, this sense that there are beautiful parts of Playa and that maybe, just maybe, he himself, in all the ways that he is a villain, is just like Kinnaman, is merely a product of the violent and cruel world into which he was born. I just feel like this one is getting so brutally underrated, and I hope with time people will come back around on it. Maybe with enough time people will stop watching it, expecting for the gimmick to eventually justify itself, and instead watch it as a film where its lack of dialogue isn't really a gimmick, where the whole point is that by excising dialogue from the narrative, Wu is really getting to think on 
on his feet and explore the ways in which he can choreograph not just action, but the camera and editing itself to fill in the gaps left by our expectations of dialogue. What dialogue is supposed to be there to foreshorten, Wu then has to expand cinematically, to expand it out from the margins that are neglected by most action movies. And I found that terribly effective, and I don't understand why more people aren't appreciating it. As long as we're mentioning filmmakers like Ridley Scott and Martin Scorsese coming through with the straight heat in the very late days of their careers, we ought to be putting some more respect on Wu's name among them. Because I think this is a masterpiece among the best art house action movies I've seen since The Raid 2 and Drive. I'm giving Silent Night a four and a half out of five. Do not sleep on this one. See it in the big screen. With that, I'm going to close things out. Thanks for sticking around for another episode. Like, subscribe, bell, yada yada. My name is Ian Garcia. This is Devotional Criticism, and this was the new movie diary. I'll catch you guys next time.